What is a mayonnaise hole? I'm very glad you asked that question. So Aaron, I guess before we begin, before we deep dive into this, I just wanted to ask, are you from Tucson? And what do you think about the whole connection with the town of Tucson from Earthbound? Well, here's what's funny is um, I grew up in Phoenix here. So I, I have lived in Arizona for most of my life. As a kid, I was I, I really wanted to get into film. I, I did theater and stuff in high school. So I came down to Tucson to attend the University of Arizona Film School. And so I actually was not, I, I knew what Earthbound was, like I knew it was a game, but um, it really wasn't until I got brought onto the project that I made the Tucson, Tucson connection. I think in a, his um, book, his Legends of Localization book, Clyde referred to it being some sort of like, a, I'm misquoting him, but something like cosmic irony that, of course, it, Tucson becomes the the city where all the mother fans of that generation kind of are are congregated. I think you can relate to this. Um, growing up, you know, there's not a whole lot of media that's about Arizona that isn't like Westerns. And so getting to see a kind of a tip of the hat to Tucson in the game is uh, is pretty cool. For sure. That is uh, one of my favorite books ever. I love Clyde's work. I've reread it a ton of times. Whenever I'm in the mood to replay Earthbound, whenever I'm tempted to get through it again, I think about the time investment. So instead, I'll usually just pick up that book, flip through. It satisfies what I'm looking for. Yeah, his um, all of his books are uh, on on the Legends localization are just amazing. They're like something you would expect to see in like a college syllabus or something. They're just so in depth and well done. It's also nice to poke around on the website. He doesn't update it too often, but when he does, it's a treat. Uh, I wanted to know though, do you play a lot of video games in general? And if not, what are your other hobbies? Yeah, so um, I would say that I am the definition of a casual gamer. I enjoy video games. I play them from time to time. I've uh, never really been like a huge gamer. I'm much more of a film person. I'm very into history, that sort of thing. You know, it was interesting because, you know, as a kid, I played a lot of video games, as I think most people do. And uh, growing up, I, wa I watched a lot of retro gaming YouTube of the you know, mid to late aughts, uh, like the angry video game nerd and stuff like that. And so coming to this job and getting to work on this film was really an opportunity for me to kind of dive back into it. I would say for video games, I'm a big fan of point and click adventure games. I either like games that have really good linear stories or are very open world sandbox kind of exploration. So I, I kind of go between the two. I mean, the writing is what drew me into Earthbound in the first place. Have you played all of the mother games and do you have a favorite one? I got brought onto this project in mid 2020. So I was kind of um, on the last third of its total production cycle, kind of like the last really big push that started a few years ago. And so when I got brought on, I had heard of Earthbound. I think I'd watched a couple of videos about it, but I, I, I was so ignorant about it that I, I thought that um, Ness and Smash Brothers was like a reference to like Howard and Nestor or something like that. I, did, I didn't really make the connection. I saw Ness and I'm like, yeah, the NES, right? There's Rob the Robot. They're all there. But I, I went ahead and uh, when, I, when I got the job and read more about the games, I was like, okay, I'm not really big on like finishing games, but I said like I have to play enough of these to be able to get enough of a grasp of it. Because as as a producer, right, I'm not the director of the film. Like Jazzy's got you know encyclopedic knowledge of Earthbound, um, as do many other people who work at Fangamer. But for me, I was like I need to know enough about this to kind of get it so that I can when I'm working on this, I can make the right decisions. And so I have played a fair amount of Mother Two and uh, Mother Three. I have not, unfortunately, hate to admit it, have not beaten either game. I've not played Mother 1. Of the ones that I've played, I definitely think, and again, you know, saying this as somebody who didn't finish either game uh, yet, I, I really was struck with, with how different Mother 3 was. Again, as a film person, just kind of playing that game, I was like, this is like a really well-crafted movie, almost, and just the way that story unfolds. I definitely was very, very impressed by the writing. And I think as we learn more about Shigesato Itoi and kind of the history behind the games, getting to kind of see like, oh, here are these kind of autobiographical things he's putting into it, or these kind of real world influences that he's infusing into it. And to kind of build off of that, one thing I did do as well was I also tried my hand at some of the other RPGs from that time period, just to try to kind of, uh, you know, get enough of a grasp on like, this is what was out at the same time. And so I played through uh, most of Chrono Trigger and a couple of other games too, but I would definitely say from a writing perspective, 
Earthbound was, you know, heads and shoulders, the most sophisticated one. It's funny that you mention how different Mother 3 is from Earthbound. I remember Itoi mentioned in an interview that Chewie translated that he had wanted to move away from the road movie that most every RPG was at the time, like Earthbound. Mother 3, on the other hand, has a smaller cast, but you spend more time with each and every NPC, and the one town, Tasmili itself, is more like the main character. I definitely uh, got that vibe, right? Earthbound is kind of like classic hero's journey storytelling. Uh, Ness and uh, friends have to go to distant lands, and they have to conquer a big enemy. Whereas, like, with Mother 3, yeah, it's about the one town, and it, it it's a much more kind of, I think, like, inward kind of struggle that the town has. It's about, like, the deterioration of a community. I, I kind of look at it like, and, and, and hopefully this was something that was kind of made clear with the film, was, you know, you kind of get to the end and you see what Mother 3 was, and you're like, Earthbound was a really hard game for them to sell, and Mother 3 is, like, such a next-level experience. Both games are very, very difficult to capture in, like, an advertising slogan or a... Uh, in the kind of way that games are marketed. I mean, they're, they're really like, they're just such great ex examples of the video game medium that were so far ahead of their time that it was almost like the market couldn't really, didn't really know what to do with them. Oh yeah, absolutely. And speaking of the film, I wanted to now ask what initially drew you into the world of filmmaking? Yeah, um, well, I've, like a lot of people who get into film, it, I think it started as kind of a childhood interest, like the mechanics and how films were made. I, I grew up being born in the late 1990s. I kind of grew up in the golden age of um, bonus features on DVDs, right? Where you would go to Blockbuster and not only were you going to watch this cool movie, but you would have these like documentaries on there that would be how they made it and everything. And so I, I definitely got uh, hooked in through that. And then as I got older, you know, my, my, my interests um, expanded and I, I, you know, I got interested in music and I, I did theater pretty hard for a few years. But then by the time that um, high school ended, I was kind of faced with, you know, OK, what am I going to go study? What am I going to try to commit myself to? And just kind of looking at my love of film and then also the um, I think the emergence of so much video that's in our world now, um, I made the choice to go to film school. While there, you know, I, I entered film school the way a lot of people do, which is they go go in wanting to be like feature fiction film directors. And about partway through, I took a documentary class and was just ended up watching a lot of documentaries. While I still love fiction film and I, you know, worked on them and what have you, I saw a documentary really kind of came into my focus of like, oh, this is really cool. This is a great fusion of my interests. I get to deal with real life. I get to deal with things in the real world in a cinematic way. And yeah, that was kind of the, the path that I have uh, found myself on. I was inspired to do what I do today because of a high school video editing class. I realized that creating YouTube content was all of my interests amalgamated like a chimera into one hobby. I've always loved writing. I have a graphic design background, so Photoshop is really very fun to me, and I'm fascinated by the reactions I can evoke from people via stories that I tell. This all combined under the umbrella topic of video games is my channel. Yeah, and, and and isn't it great that there's a platform now where not only can you make that content and post it, but you can go as deep as you want and you can amass an audience. It, it's, a, it's a huge new medium for all sorts of um, storytellers. 100%. So I guess now that we know what inspires each other, I would like to know how you found yourself involved with Fangamer in the first place. What is your day-to-day -day at the company like, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, sure. Um, well, I'll start by talking about how I got involved in Fangamer in general, and then I can I can go a little more into what my uh, job duties are. So I, in film school, a very good friend of mine, Sarah Liu, who is uh, the other co-producer, one of the other co-producers on this film, she uh, graduated a little bit before me, and she ended up working on uh, at Fangamer because she had met Jazzy through some local film events here in town. I had even actually, ironically, as kind of as a freelancer, had helped out a little bit with one of the Earthbound USA shoots, and I knew they were working on the documentary. At that time, I did not know really anything about Fangamer. I didn't know anything about Mother. I didn't know anything about the documentary. I just knew that that was something that they were working on. You know, I graduated in the spring, the spring of 2019. I kind of tried the freelance thing for a while, and then... In March of 2020, the uh, the COVID pandemic really it, it came to it came to the United States and uh, oh yes yeah exactly and, and the entire uh, film industry basically shut down like it was just there's no work right because it, it just there's nothing was being shot we were all under quarantine due to the uh, you know deadly virus and so 
I was kind of just like, um, you know, I was I was just kind of floating around. And then in July of that year, I got a phone call from Sarah and Jazzy. And they basically said, like, you know, we uh, need to get this documentary finished. We, we we've realized we need more help to work on it. And because I had worked on some documentary stuff uh, in college, I said, absolutely. And I, I packed up my stuff in my car and drove down to Tucson and then got started through that. And so my first couple of years at F Fangamer were pretty much documentary uh, exclusively, just working on the documentary. And that's been most of my work there. However, recently, kind of as we've transitioned, as the documentary is kind of entering its final stages of release, I've transitioned more into their um, general video production stuff that they do. And so we we do a lot of product videography. We work on commercial stuff for them. And we also, uh, you know, just try to provide as much like video support to the company as possible. And so it's been a really nice way to stay involved and work with the company while we kind of uh, get the film ready to uh, be seen by everybody. I uh, also wanted to ask about your unique position as the archival producer for this film. How would you personally define your own role, and what would you say is the most rewarding slash challenging aspect of it? Oh, yes. Uh, good question. In our production, now, a, a lot of people over the years have helped out on Earthbound USA, right? For a little, little here and there, some people for longer than others. And, you know, it really, it really was like a, a lot of people worked on the film, but especially in kind of the last three years where we really were on the trajectory towards we need to finish this. We need to put this out. It needs to, it needs to be done and done right. Um, it really was a core team of three producers, Jazzy, our editor Daniel came out for a year, and then um, you know we had some vis we have visual effects artists at Fan Gamer, Stephen Everdred, who did that kind of work. But for a feature length documentary film, as a a very small team, right? I wouldn't say it's necessarily an unusually small team, but for the kind of film that we were doing. It was it was very much an independent film in that we were all kind of doing a little bit of everything, right? We were helping with shoots, we were helping with the edit when we're, where we could. But my domain, kind of my my big role, was as the archival producer. And uh, I'll explain a little bit about what that job is for your uh, for your audience. Is that when you're dealing with a feature length documentary, so this is something that is going to be shown in movie theaters or it's going to be released on DVD, right? You have if you're making a documentary and you're going to be using materials in it, you have to ensure that you are within the boundaries of the law, the copyright law, in order to have your film be a legally viable production that can be released and you can uh, share it with other people. And so the archival producer is somebody who there's kind of two facets to the job. The first facet is the archival research, which is either going out and trying to find materials for the film or um, trying to organize materials that already exist and kind of be there to support the director and the editor if they need something. And then the second part of that is the uh, what is referred to as legal clearances, which is making sure that the things that we have, we can use. And so a lot of my job was doing not only the archival research, which was, you know, looking through film archives, but also like trying to find certain things online. But it was also like trying to track down either permissions for um, what we already had kind of assembled or also the other other big component of that is fair use. I could talk about fair use a little bit if you'd like. Aaron, I would love that because as a YouTuber, fair use and what constitutes fair use is very relevant and interesting to me. So please go on. Yeah, yeah. I was I was thinking about this morning. I was like, God, I'm really glad I get to talk to a YouTuber about this because it's a common struggle. So as anybody who's either works in YouTube, is there a YouTuber or has worked like has watched YouTube videos is aware to some degree of fair use. And it is a concept that is very, very, very important, but it is very misunderstood, I feel like. Basically, the way it works is this, right? In the United States, which is where the country where we made the film, kind of the rudimentary background to this is that if you create something, you automatically own the copyright to it, right? Unless there's some other agreement that was made before it was completed. When you own the intellectual property of something, you have the discretion to be able to allow people to use it if you want, or say, don't use that if you don't want to. But there is a provision in the copyright law, which is known as fair use. And what fair use basically is, is it's kind of like a, a refuge for free speech within our copyright law. So it says that you know, if I'm going to review a movie and I need to show a clip from a movie in order to do that review, right, in order to make my point to say, oh, in this scene, this happened and what that, 
it's not copyright infringement if I use that clip for that purpose, right? But there's very specific parameters under which it can be used. But the thing about fair use is that fair use is not like a license. It's not like an automatic thing you just like select and you're like, oh, great, this is fair use. It's a legal defense, which is, would be used in the event of a lawsuit. What you'll see on YouTube uh, sometimes, and it's uh, just because of misunderstanding, you'll see like somebody will post an entire song and then in the description, it'll have this, you know, copy pasta from the fair use uh, thing. And y yes, I see that all the time. Yeah, uh, I, I'm reminded of that meme of the kid sleeping in the bed and the guy's like got his arms outstretched and he's protecting from the from the fire or whatever. And it's like they think it's like the shield that gives them that. And that's not really what fair use is. So what you have to do when you're doing a film, and I do believe some YouTubers do this, some of the bigger ones who have more resources, is you have to not only be able to find the material, you have to identify who owns it. And then if you're going to invoke fair use for it, you have to use it within these specific parameters. And then in order to ensure that you are using this in what would like most likely be fair use, you have to work with lawyers. And so you have to have a fair use, you have to have, to have a legal team be able to review a spreadsheet basically that goes along with the film that for every individual item that you want to invoke fair use on, and then they go in and they judge whether or not in their expert opinion, it can be fair use or not fair use. And what, the, and what that does is that allows the film to be insured, right? And that is also a vote of confidence in other people to say, these people did their due diligence in order to make sure that they're using material that was not directly licensed. So for example, something like earthbound gameplay footage in our film, that we are doing it in a way that is not infringing on the intellectual property rights of the copyright owner. In a film, it's it, it, in a lot of documentaries, it's usually not one or the other, like not everything is going to be fair use and not everything is going to be licensed. It can kind of be a mixture of both. And that was what our film was. The, I, I would say the big difference between fair use on YouTube and fair use in the film world all kind of comes down to the algorithm, right? Like we don't have a like robot that is assessing our film and making a decision on it, which um, means that we don't have to play by the robot's rules. We get to play by the law. But then on the, on the flip side, you know, we just have to make sure that we're doing things correctly in order to ensure that we're not violating, we're not, we're not, we're not doing any sort of copyright or intellectual property infringement. And the thing I'll say to that too, is that um, what kind of made this challenging for as a film is that the gray area between what is copyright infringement and what is not copyright infringement is very much the story of being an online fan of a video game, right? <laughs> like it's kind, it's kind of, yeah, it's in that. And so there was a lot of, um, thankfully, we had a really good team of lawyers we were able to work with to ensure that what we did was done right. It was definitely a learning experience for sure. Once we got the guidance, you know, our editors took that and it was relatively smooth sailing, you know, like we wanted to make sure that this film was following the rules and was going to be good and be releasable in order to get it to that point the amount of like research and conferring with the lawyers and, and all the spreadsheet work and stuff like that you know it's 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 a lot of labor but but the result of that is that we can put the film out confidently and we can also rest easy knowing that we didn't step on anybody's toes in order to do it at least for legally speaking from when I first kind of got brought on and then after the first few months, we kind of realized we want this to, we, we need to do this. It was about two years of le back and forth legal work to get it to the final place where it is today. Wow, I am just impressed at how meticulous a process it is. And I appreciate you pointing out the differences between fair use on YouTube versus in a film. On YouTube, I was living in fear for about two years because Sony was making a lot of copyright claims on Earthbound Music in particular, just the Super Nintendo game, so I couldn't use it for a while. But yeah, the difference is that it's an automated process. I have to abide by the robot's rules or else I'll get a copyright strike. You, as an archival producer, work with real people and lawyers to navigate the red tape and get the film ready for distribution. Yeah. I should also preface and say to anybody listening that um, I am not giving legal advice to anybody. You know, I'm I'm speaking for myself, but 
in my personal opinion, as just an independent filmmaker, there are times I will watch YouTube videos and I'll see things and go, in my amateur opinion, eh, it's probably not fair use. But then there's times I'll see things get taken down that in a legal setting probably are fair use. And so it's a really tricky, uh, it's a really tricky thing. And what I'll say too is that we were very, very fortunate to have a production company and the resources to be able to um, go through all of this. And I think about, there's, there's kind of the question of like, why aren't there more independent documentaries about video games, things that aren't necessarily affiliated with the uh, the companies that make the games? And there there are plenty of them out there, but I, I think it's a very difficult because you're making something that's very difficult to, to thread legally. And so you, you have to have a legal team and do it the right way. And so um, it'll be very interesting to see as the uh, years roll on how copyright law will change or evolve or or stay the same in regards to it. Because I think like... I joked last night that, in my opinion, the copyright laws have kind of barely caught up to the 20th century, and we are now well within the social media age. And it's uh, it, it, it makes things more challenging, but in that, there's a lot of room to learn about, about it and how it works in that. So, yeah. I also just wanted to, for the audience, kind of steal a question from last night. How do you know so much about the specifics of copyright law? Were you taught a lot of it at your university? How much did you have to learn yourself when you became an archival producer? I learned a lot at the U of A Film School. We have a, a fantastic documentary faculty, and I learned a lot about the film industry and filmmaking. But, you know, this stuff with the archival producing, it's a very specialized kind of field within it. And so there wasn't exactly like a class on it. I mean, there were we, we talked about the legal rules in school and like we had to, we had to abide by them with our screens. Right. But. I didn't necessarily know a lot of the ins and outs of it, and I, I wouldn't necessarily expect a uh, undergraduate degree in film to, you know, uh, hit that really hard just because there's so many other things to teach. And so it's not a it's not a knock on my school at all. A very, very good film school, um, in my opinion. But w what happened was, was that when we when I got brought on, you know, it was something that it just became very apparent, right, when we were we assembled the final team, when when myself and Brittany Olson, the other producer, were brought on, that, okay, you know, we want to actually finish this movie and release it formally. You know, we, we need to just make sure that we're doing it as by the book as possible. Because of that, I I forget exactly how it shook out, but what, what more or less happened was I I was kind of in charge of um kind of leading the charge on that and um with 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 everyone else's help, of course. And I purchased a book called Clearance and Copyright, a very like well-known book about here's all the legal stuff you need to know about being a filmmaker. And so reading that book, I I, I kind of got a game plan for how it was going to go down. I took a class a little bit later through the uh, like service based out of uh, France that, that kind of goes more into detail with it too. But from there, it became obvious that uh, we needed to get a team of lawyers. And so I uh, flipped over the book and saw the law firm that put out the book and said, you know, why can't we just use these guys? And so thankfully, Fangamer was very open to the idea. And again, I, I can't speak on behalf of our lawyers or I, I don't represent them at all, but they were a really big help. They were very patient with me. So it was kind of a it was kind of a process of learning while doing, but it was also a process of um, it was just one of those things where once we kind of knew the rules and we were able to bring that to the editors, we were able to make it work. It was it was definitely a learning curve. I don't know. I, I also think it just made for a better film in the end, because when you are really in that mindset of like there are specific materials that we are not going to be able to license and we can only use them in these specific ways. Well, a lot of the ways that fair use works is like good storytelling. What do you what do you need to use this for to make your point? You don't want to use more. You can't use more than is necessary. So what is absolutely necessary to make your point? It, uh, I think, is it was inducive to trying to fit this massive story into a, you know, 100 minute film. So I'm someone who loves deep diving into obscure video game topics. I have a few favorite websites I like to start with. I was wondering, where do you begin with your own line of work and how does it develop from there? With this project, we had a few like really big assets by the time I got involved, which was most of the interviews, not all of them, but a very large portion of them were shot and in the can by the time I got involved. Um, and so we had this massive amount of these kind of firsthand accounts, right, that we're going to make up our film. It's an interview based documentary. And then from there, we have a lot of people at 
fan gamer who are not only experts in Earthbound, which is very helpful, but they were around when that the whole Starman saga was going on. We had access to a massive collection of the original Starman posts, right? Or the ones that have survived the internet, the ones that still exist. Or if you have the Wayback Machine. Yes, yes, the Wayback Machine. Um, shout out to the Internet Archive. I uh, love them. But it would really depend on kind of what part of the film we were working on, because with the way kind of documentary film works is that you do a lot of research before the production. And then when you're actually in the production, you're kind of shooting it, editing it and writing it at the same time. Because unlike a fiction film where you have a script that is kind of done in, in advance, the editing on a fiction film is very involved, right? It's a very big job. But in documentary, it's like all of the writing of the film is done in the editing. Like you, you obviously do some of that beforehand when you do interviews and you go shooting, you want to get stuff that's going to be usable for whatever you're trying to say. We were kind of working alongside the editing the entire time, pretty much up until the end. Depending on what it was, you know, we, we, would, we would do different levels of research. And so when it came to trying to just understand the story, not necessarily looking for materials, but understanding the story. We did a lot of different things. Obviously, we had a general knowledge of it, but there were also specific moments in the film where we really had to just sit down and go, okay, like, for example, one of the more, I would say, like, labyrinth chapters of this story is the uh, Earthbound 64 days. You have a game that was delayed. Its production was very mysterious for a very long time, and you kind of had this burgeoning fan community that was dealing with it. And so we ended up creating this master timeline on a, a, a document where we basically took like every month from the year like 1997 through like 2000, and we would line up with colored blocks of like, okay, this line on the grid is every month that it appeared in the release forecast and then didn't appear. Then we have where it appeared in the most wanted, right? Then we have a timeline that says, here were the official announcements that came out. Here's a timeline for when IGN posted something. And what you're able to get from that is you can go, and it was actually really interesting. You don't see this a ton in the final film, but you're in this kind of position where like, you're able to kind of start to see where these patterns go, where it's like, okay, I notice in this month, it's off the forecast, but then in these next couple months, it's, um, and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, paraphrasing from my memory, but it'd be like, oh, now it's on the most wanted list. And then you would go back and look into it and go, oh, but if I go to the website archives, I can see that there was a coordinated campaign to try to get it onto the most wanted list at that time. And so that sort of thing to just kind of wrap your head around it. That sort of preparation is very important when you do um, interviews to, to, to make the most of the, of the time and the material. When it came to looking for footage, it depended on what we were doing. So, you know, that might involve looking through film archives, for example, for licensing footage. And so you have to get creative with that. It's very rare that you could like go to a, even like a really robust, fantastic, like news footage archive. You can't just search like Earthbound 1995 and really expect for anything to come up, right? Like it, it's, it wasn't, at the time it was not that notable. So it wasn't, it wasn't something that would necessarily be on the radar. But if you search, you know, okay, Redmond, Washington, Nintendo headquarters, 1988 through, you know, 1996. And you'll, you, you can find stuff like that. And then a, an, another big part of it too, was just trying to find uh, collections of printed materials, of magazines, of reviews and stuff like that. And so a lot of it is just getting very creative and trying to think of like, if there's something here, how do I know if I have this massive collection of materials online or in person or whatever, what are creative ways that I can get into that to maybe try to see, okay, maybe maybe their search terms are not going to find Earthbound, but they'll find something about a certain event where Earthbound might have been part of or, or uh, something, you know, just kind of making that up. But for, for as, as an example, but the other thing that was very, very helpful, we, we worked a lot with several really talented people at Mother Forever who, you know, have really taken that research. They've done a lot of really big research on the games um, over the last few years. And there's a lot of other people online. Um, you know, we're, we're friends with Frank Cifaldi at the Video Game History Foundation. And, and also locally here in town at the University of Arizona, there's the Learning Games Initiative Research Archive, the LGIRA, which is a massive game archive at the university beyond just being very supportive to kind of a side note, they like uh, allowed us to use their like PlayStation demo stations and some of our reenactments and stuff like that. And so there was a lot of help uh, with it. That reminds me, uh, does Frank Zafaldi still appear in this final version of the film in any way? I spotted his name in the credits and I know he was in one of the earlier trailers with a speaking part, but 
I don't recall seeing him. One of the things about documentary editing that uh, is something I learned very early in my career is um, there are times when the specific story that you're telling, you learn as you're going through kind of what footage like kind of needs to be a part of that and what kind of footage, no matter how great it is, doesn't really fit within that version of it. A, a great example is um, for one of my student films, I interviewed a couple of people for it. I even interviewed a U.S. congressman. And I got in the editing booth and 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 had to cut the congressman's interview out because it didn't really work for the film, right? It was a great interview and I had a great time with him. But with with Frank Cifaldi, yes, uh, Frank and then a few other people gave fantastic interviews. And then just kind of as we were getting this story about the Starman in particular and the scope we were doing, it didn't fit into that. But the good news is, is that there will be some footage from some of the interviews that we shot that we did not um, use in the film. And some excerpts of that will be available on the uh Bonus features on the Blu-ray edition of Earthbound USA. That was my next question. I heard whispers last night about the original cuts, and it was apparently two and a half hours long. Specifically, and Aaron, I don't even know if I can talk about this, but there was a scene about Final Fantasy VII and the transition between the golden age of 2D 16-bit gaming into the third dimension. Could you speak about that at all, what we didn't get, or shall we wait into the physical release? Oh, uh, no, I, I, I can talk kind of generally about it. Sure. Uh, so I've probably seen 10 different versions of this film over the years, like like complete edits of it that have that have changed. And so about a year ago, we put in this massive push to get like, I, I would say like what, what they would probably call in film, like the fine cut, which is kind of like it's not a rough cut. It's it's like very, getting very close and then just kind of needs more trimming. And that version, um, you know, and, and, and one of the things that, that you find whenever you're making a documentary about like a specific like niche or subject, you're kind of towing this line between you want the, your documentary to contain new information and to appeal to people who are um, coming in with no background or technical knowledge. Yeah, you want it to make sense with, without having to be like really into it, but you also want it to have enough editorial value that it's not like, you know, somebody who knows about it is going to watch it and go, oh, okay, I've heard all this before, right? You want it to kind of be able to appeal to both. And so what it can be difficult is you kind of have to become an expert, or at least you have to know a lot about your subject when you're making a film. And so then you're in this kind of interesting position where you'll make a cut of something and you'll go, this makes sense to me because I've been living in this for years, but I, I I don't know if this is gonna make sense to other people. I mean, if you think about it, you, you may have had this experience. I have certainly had it when trying to explain this movie to like my, my grandparents, right? Of being like, okay, so the series is called Mother in Japan, but it's called Earthbound here. So Mother One was translated as Earthbound, but it didn't come out. So then Mother 2 got translated as Earthbound and that did come out. But the sequel is called like there were a lot of parts of this story that, you know, we put a lot of it onto the drawing board that kind of went into the weeds as, as Jazzy talks about it, because we thought it was like essential information. And then as you as as you know, we did some um, kind of uh, test screenings for some of the fan gamer people over time. It's just kind of like, you know, maybe that's not as important to this story as as some of this other stuff is like other stuff about the characters and about earthbound specifically and, and what have you and so um yeah uh what i would say is that i have seen the longer versions of this film and i can tell you with 100 percent certainty that the version uh you saw and that everyone else we've seen is the best version of the film it took a lot of work to get there but i think that the 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 trimming down and um it wasn't so much trimming down as it just was kind of readjusting and, and going down different routes than the ones that were in those versions i think makes for a uh a better film at the end of the day and you successfully made a film that my wife can join me and watch and appreciate. She hasn't played much of the Mother series, but knows about it from me, of course, so I actually haven't really gotten a chance to speak with her about it yet and what she thinks, but she seemed to enjoy it all throughout. She just got home from work, so I'll be talking to her after to get her opinion. I'm very curious. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's it, it's funny uh, that you mentioned that thing, because um, that is something that I, I would bring up every now and again when we talk about what's the movie for. And I said, OK, imagine a couple is sitting on the couch. One partner loves Earthbound. The other one knows Earthbound because they love it, but aren't as into it. Can we make a film that is able to exceed both of their expectations, like that, that is able to appeal to both of them? And if we can do that, yeah. Without pausing and me having to explain it to her. Yes, absolutely. 
I did actually lean over to whisper in her ear once during the screening to tell her that uh, radiation was Toby Fox and her eyes lit up. I have a handful of fun questions coming up though, or at least they're fun to me. So, PK Rockin, PK Love, what would your signature psi power be? In other words, what's your favorite thing? Oh, my favorite thing? Ooh, I, I do, you know, PK sleeping. I love, I love a good nap. Oh yes, I like that answer. I think mine would be PK coffee. I'll have to go to sleep after this myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's good. Um, that's, uh, you know, one of the things that I love about Earthbound that when I played it and I, I th this is just a testament to the genius of that game is you put all that information in at the beginning and I don't know, I don't know what it is, but I've played through the beginning several times just because I, I, I played it before I got the job and started it and I started it again. And you always forget that you put that info in when it comes back up on the screen for you. It just like it always surprises you. Yeah, I've seen many threads people have created online asking why Ness's power is called PK whatever, but it's because they put it in themselves at the beginning of the game. So yeah, it, it was very effective, I think. My next question though, if your life were a game, that game specifically being Mother 4, how would it compare to the rest of the series? If my life were Mother 4, it's a good question. I think that it would probably be a more boring version of Earthbound. This was something that I really picked up, not just from um, my like kind of playing of it, but also just kind of learning more about it toying the game, is that the kind of stuff that he put into it, and I think is the stuff that is in a lot of the um, mother-like games that have kind of come out of the Earthbound fandom, a lot of it is like really relatable humor based in real life, even if it's in a kind of an extreme sci-fi version of it. We all knew a Pokey in school. He didn't necessarily become like a Lovecraftian eldritch horror and like, um, you know, travel to a different dimension. But um, we all we all knew a kid like that, right? We all knew like that sort of thing. And so, um, yeah, I would say like like basically Earthbound without the aliens um, is probably more what my life was, would be like. Excellent, I agree, and I might just ask that the creator turn down the difficulty a little bit in an update or a patch. But that's not uh, important at all. What is important is mayonnaise hole. Aaron, may I ask, what is a mayonnaise hole? I'm very glad you asked that question. So, this is uh, this is actually it's actually re really funny. So, my first ever experience with Van Gamer was. I very briefly appeared at their um, Halloween party a couple years before I was a guest of Sarah's. She worked there at the time and I did not. And they were playing Manny's Hole there, like when I walked in. And basically Manny's Hole, I'm not sure where it started. You know, uh, experts disagree. I like to believe that people have been playing Manny's Hole for many hundreds of years. But I believe it, uh, it began at either the uh, conventions or something. But basically the idea is... There's like a tube. It's like a like a paper towel tube or like a toilet paper roll tube that is set up straight. And you have a fishing pole that has a little tiny um packet of like mayonnaise on it, like one of those little ones you get at like a cafeteria. And you have to stand behind a certain point. Like you cannot cross the line, but you have to get this mayonnaise packet into the hole. And it's spaced out in such a way that it's very, very difficult. Um, and it's a it's a very fun game. It's a great party game. And I will say this: one of our coworkers at Fan Gamer, uh, Jack, he has created a VR game for Mayonnaise Hole, where you can play Mayonnaise Hole in VR, and you can play it off of a skyscraper. You can play it on top of a moving truck, and do all of these sorts of things. And so Mayonnaise Hole is, uh, I really think it is like America's game, America's pastime. It's a it's a classic. That VR game is how I became aware of this local, now global, legend. Yeah, and and I, and I will say this: um, it's a really fun game. Like he really, it, it <laughs> it's 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 a hoot. Yeah, I'm glad that the mayonnaise whole tradition, um, you know, lives on. So another quick thing: I saw that you were credited as a prop designer on the film. Is that correct? Yes. I, I wanted to ask about that. Uh, did you have a hand in the big clearance bin of Earthbound boxes that was on display yesterday outside of the theater? Uh, no, I, I did not get involved. I, w I did not build that specific one. I almost missed that. I just about walked right by it. I'm so happy I went back. Yeah. You know what's funny is um, we put that out there because we, we have all these, we just got all these fake Earthbound boxes, props, right? Because, I mean, 
we weren't going to spend fifty thousand dollars on buying a giant crate full of you know mint condition uh, earthbound boxes so we created prop versions of them and um we set it up as like an installation outside of the movie theater and we had to run back over and write on the on the sign don't take them with you because we saw people going in and taking them which i don't blame them um but yeah so when it uh, comes to the prop making so i did not do we had a great production designer, Sarah Lou, uh, one of our pro producers, was a production designer. And um, Steve Campos, our visual effects artist, did a lot of work in the props department in terms of like getting some of those boxes and stuff like assets that could be printed. You know, as I said, it was it was kind of an all hands on deck thing. And I have some Photoshop skill. And so in some of the reenactments, of which there are quite a few in the documentary, there are kind of little props here and there that I helped make for it. And so I forget we, we went so fast. It was just kind of like a thing we did. I forget if there were any in particular that come to my mind that we made that I made. Yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of like. Oh man, we need an insert on this desk. We need something to put on the desk that we can legally clear. Uh, let's just make something in Photoshop that will, you know, that'll work for that. And then I saw your name pop up a few times in the film, not counting the credits. Uh, for example, I saw they were listed at the bottom right of a yearbook. And then there was a screen name that said something like Aaron Car Guy on a Starman form. I was wondering at first if that was your actual username on Starman, but it doesn't sound like it because you came to the Earthbound community later on. So was that just a wild coincidence or a little Easter egg? Here's uh, here's here's how that worked. A lot of the material in the film that you see from the website is is material we pulled straight from Starman.net. But there are times in a documentary, we have reenactments, right? We have actors playing characters in order to kind of like take a lot of history and kind of confine it into one scene, right? For the purposes of the movie. And so because of that, there were, there were kind of instances where we would have... 50 comments of something on an actual page that kind of all pointed to the same idea, but we needed something that was going to kind of put them together succinctly into, into one comment. And then with stuff like that, we wanted it to look, it had, it had to fit on the screen, but it was not a literal thing we put from the website. So what I did on a couple of cases was I would use my own name just because I didn't have to legally clear it. It was my name, right? I, I can do whatever I want with my name. And then as I started doing that, when there were other instances where we had to either cover things or, or replace things like with the yearbook, for example, there's a shot with the yearbook. Well, we weren't going to put your real people's names from that yearbook in there. So that'd be a whole other process of getting permission from them. Yes. Y yeah. I mean, and, and, and I don't know about the fair use of whether we could or couldn't have, but we didn't want to. Right. We didn't want we were just like, yeah. We uh, threw in a couple of our names, and I, th I think our co-editor, Daniel Maggio, thought it was funny, and he would just, like, in certain effect shots that needed that sort of thing. And so I'm also in the film quite a bit, too. Like, there's a couple of shots, like the uh, Earthbound Zero ROM getting slammed into the ROM dumper. That's my hand, so... Um... Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of little things like that, but uh, it's all kind of par for the course when you're making a documentary with uh, reenactments. Well, I got a kick out of it. Another funny thing in the film I noticed, I just wanted to quickly mention, uh, there's one part where you're showing how the oversized earthbound box, while attention grabbing, was actually a curse, because retail workers couldn't fit them in with the other games. The scene was effective because a time lapse plays out showing shoppers grabbing everything but earthbound. And there's one girl who chose Bubsy over Earthbound, and that broke my heart a little bit, but I thought it was funny. Was that an intentional jab that even notorious games like Bubsy were being picked over Earthbound, or could it have been any game? Oh, uh, it, it, it wasn't a jab at any particular game. What, what, what it was was that we were creating this game store set, and as we were learning about fair use, you know, we were like, we really want this to feel as authentic as possible to really create the idea of like, this is the, now the store is a fictional store, right? It's a fictional logo and everything like that. But the idea being that we really want to show Earthbound in its context of when it came out. We uh, originally were thinking, are we going to have to put a bunch of like fake games in there, like design knockoff games? And with work with our lawyers, we were able to find out that we could use um, the real games that were available around the time that Earthbound came out. And so, um, I'm not going to claim that we got 100% right or anything, uh, but um, a lot of those games were kind of contemporary titles. And so for that scene, we really just wanted to have that image of time is passing, right? The win the window is closing and this these just these beautiful earthbound boxes at the bottom are 
just neglected while everyone else is going in with these other games. And so it was filmed basically as it was like a giant line over the course of like five minutes. It'd be like, walk in. Okay, you take that one. You take this one. Just to make sure we had kind of like even coverage of it, right? Because you don't want it to be like, you want it to be kind of a balanced image for it. And so, yes, I would not choose Bubsy over Earthbound. But uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the 90s were a different time. I also wanted to know during production, and I know you came onto the project later on, but was there an added pressure to work faster because of Kickstarter backers that had been following the project since 2014? What were the reactions to perhaps negative responses to the delays within Fangamer? Our Kickstarter backers are the reason that this project is what it is. You know, we felt a big obligation to them to get something out that was going to be very, um, that was really going to satisfy them. It's tough to back something and wait for many, many years that goes over schedule for it. There was a lot of support from a lot of our backers too, and they were very, very patient. They were kind of like the thing that kept everything moving because at the end of the day, it was like, no matter, no matter what problems or issues came up with the production, it was like, we have to make sure that they get their copy of it. <laughs> right. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I owe my job to the Kickstarter backers. So yeah, overall I, um, am, and we're just so happy to be able to give them what they did. And, and, and my hope is that they will, um, they will see their role that got us to this point. I mean, it, it would have been literally impossible without them. Were you not necessarily hoping that this wouldn't happen, but, uh, was there a certain point that you would really hesitate to make more edits and delay the film further if, say, Nintendo dropped a bombshell like announcing an Earthbound remake or even Mother 3? Did you hope that Nintendo didn't announce anything more major involving the series until Earthbound USA was out? That's a very good question. Uh, there was part of me, I'm not going to lie to you, that when there would be a new Direct, I'd be going, not today, not today, not today. But that's also tempered by the fact that after working on this for so many years, like you guys really do need to release this game or having the hope that the game would come out. Right. Um, so it was kind of a balance. But here's how we paid for the film. We got to a certain point in the edit of a, a year or two and we realized that the actual story that we're telling would not change that much if at the 11th hour the game was released. Right. Because there was still all these years of waiting and this and this kind of like this idea of the Starman generation and, and their story, right? Right, over the span of 20 or so years. Yes, yeah, over a really long time. And so like, would would it releasing, if it, if it had come out before we finished the film, we would have had to have acknowledged it, right? Like, you, you know, we, we couldn't have the title card that said it hasn't come out yet, but it would really be the chapter of a new story in, in the Earthbound fandom. I mean, it, it, it would be a, like a total new era. And I think that our film is kind of about how we got to the current era. We got to to a point where we didn't really worry too much about it. But it was also like, I will I will be honest, like working at Fangamer, every time those directs come on again, I'd have that kind of like, I don't want to deal with this today. Please don't announce Mother 3. But then on the other hand, I go, if I'm if they're gonna announce this game, I want them to announce it while I'm here with these people because it's going to be like like a major celebration. It's going to be like the end of Return of the Jedi or something like that. Yes, and then it'd make a nice line at the end of the film. You could just put a little asterisk and say, and Mother 3 was finally released. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'll say this too, is that Clyde's translation, and this is again, in my opinion, Clyde's translation is, an, is, an, is a world-class translation of that game. I think that Clyde's translation is excellent. And perhaps more faithful than an official translation by Nintendo could be. Yeah. In my personal opinion, yes, I, I think it would be. But who, who knows, right? But I will say this is that um, we did talk to one games journalist a couple years ago who made a really good point, which was they're hoping for the official release because they want to be able to have it be easily accessible so it can enter kind of the video game canon. And so there's a lot of arguments, I think, on kind of either side of the issue to say, oh, we've already got this excellent translation, right? On the other hand, there is there is something to be said about, you know, the game being able to exist officially in America. One of the biggest things I've noticed about the difference between mother fans of that era and mother fans today is that a lot of people, not not all of them, but, but there's a lot of um, like very young mother fans, right? People who are my age and younger people born in the late nineties or the, in the aughts, like the Gen Z as they call them. And for people of, of our generation, mother three has been out since we were kids. 
not 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 officially, but the translation has. And so the quest for Mother Three is a lot less central. I and this is again just from my outsider's perspective, it seems to be less central. But what I have seen is the interest in Earthbound sixty four has exploded. Yes, it's incredible what they've unearthed in all of this time that's passed. Mother Forever archiving the Mother Three times. I know Cody Nokolo found and had them scanned, then sent directly over through the National Diet Library of Japan. It's just incredible to see the new and interesting things that have been discovered and preserved all these years later. Yeah, and I think that it's it's such a mystery. I, th I think I'll, all of us get kind of en enchanted by the mystery of it. Like I definitely was when I was researching it. And it's just really interesting how the uh, seeing how how much Mother Three has become part of mainstream gaming culture. When when you have um, Old Spice commercials with uh, the Mother Three art in it. Yep, Terry Crews posting about a Mother Three localization on Twitter. Yeah, I mean, like uh, I don't know how it gets gets much better than that. You know, one of the things that I uh, learned about the Mother fan base that I really like is that they're in a great example of an online community, and th and this was true back then, and it is true today. Like when we uh, that is able to kind of take their love for it, but then apply it in their own creative directions. Like I was, we um debuted our trailer as part of the mother direct uh, earlier this year and we so we watched the whole direct you know leading up to that it's great that there's so many not only really good earthbound fan games which are you know a lot of them look really good but um also the fact that it's a platform for mother like indie games and so it's become a community that's not you know that's about earthbound and about people making their own games kind of inspired by it. It's it's a really supportive group of people. Yeah, it just fosters a lot of creativity. Yes, definitely. Uh, Mother-like. I love that descriptor. Cody Nokolo claims that he wasn't the one to coin the term, but he and the Mother Forever staff certainly helped push it into public awareness with the Mother Directs. Yeah, mother like it's a it's a good uh it's a really snappy name. It it reminds me of like a name of kind of like a hip like alternative rock band from the '90s, you know, like mother like. Yeah, the, yeah, it's uh, some of those games look uh, pretty cool. Earthbound USA will become publicly available on November 27th of this year. What do you hope audiences will take away from it, and what comes next for you? So yes, Earthbound USA will be publicly available digitally on the 27th of November. Um, we are still getting some of the specifics of that ironed out. It, if you go to fangamer.com or you go to earthboundusa.com, the information will be there. And if you follow our Twitter and media, sign up for our newsletter, you will get information on how to get it when that time comes. What I hope people get from the film is a, a couple of things. One, I really hope people just enjoy it and they they have a good time watching it. But, but more than that, like... I hope that it will it will ring true for everyone who is an Earthbound fan who plays who's played the games that it's true to that experience. I hope that it speaks to people who grew up on the internet. You know, one of the things that really struck me with this uh, movie is that it's so rare to find a f uh, any film that really is about like what it was like to be on an internet forum or what it was like to have online friends kind of before today where all of our friends are online friends, right? It was this kind of time uh, where a lot of us grew up. Like I was part of an internet message board. It wasn't earthbound related. I was a bionicle man myself, but uh, a Legos. But uh, I think there's a lot in the movie that is about kind of like what it means to grow up and make connections in that new media, what it means to grow up loving something and how to kind of uh, deal with that as as you're as you're as you're growing up, right? As as more responsibilities pile on and stuff like that. I I, I hope that people are able to kind of um, see themselves in it or their experience in it. I guess is what I would say. For myself, in terms of um, what's next, our director Jazzy Benson is going to be working on a new project. I can't say much about it, but it is a fiction film, like a narrative film, that is going to be a suburban southwestern cyberpunk film so if you like cyberpunk and you like kind of the the kind of quirky lens in which uh jazzy kind of views the world as you can see in this film uh definitely follow her and stay tuned um as for myself i will be working on that i hope to work on some more documentary projects uh coming up i guess if i would uh plug anything it would be other than the film of course i have a dedicated instagram now it's at Arizona incinerated, like incinerated, like a piece of paper gets burnt up or whatever. 
And it is it is going to be a kind of a uh, hopefully a project where I will be able to share some of my documentary research about Arizona history. And if you don't live in Arizona, it is actually very interesting. But um, yeah, uh, Jazzy's new project is going to be really fun. And, you know, we're still really hoping to have some more fun with Earthbound USA while we can. I suppose I just have uh, one last question for you. Which style of windows do you prefer? We've got plain flavor, mint, strawberry, banana, peanut, grape, or melon. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I normally play with plain, but I do like mint too. So either plain or mint. That's exactly my answer, because the world of Earthbound is already pretty vibrant, so I like to have that contrast to keep it easily readable. I do find Mint to be quite pleasant, though. I like that. You gotta have the fast text speed, you know. Uh... Do you know, I, I wonder if anyone has ever played through Earthbound at a slow text speed. I'd be impressed by their patience. Yeah, it, it, I, I've never met anybody who does, but it is great, though, for, I, I guess, accessibility. Like, I would imagine, right, I'm just hypothesizing, like, if you knew English but didn't, or maybe it was a second language, um, that could be useful. Yeah, when I play it, I it, I, I like the I like the zippiness of it. Uh, there, it. It actually was funny. We were watching it last night, and uh, there was some Earthbound gameplay footage in the film that was on the fast speed, and I was going to say, should we make that slower? I don't know. But... It is more authentic to, I think, the the average gamer. The, the, I wouldn't say average, but like the a lot of the, the footage you see online is in the fast uh, speed. So that last point you made is a great one. I've often thought to myself about the text speed I've chosen for videos. Sometimes I'll need footage of a particular line, but I'll realize that I had it scrolling too fast during the gameplay session, so I'll have to go back and re-record in some cases. Earthbound is nice though because the world stays still while you're engaged in dialogue, so the only thing that moves is the flashing arrow to proceed the text box. Because of that, I can just go in and make a series of edits using the full animation of the blinking arrow to prolong the text box for as long as I need it on screen, if that makes sense. That way, I don't have to replay up until a certain part of the game just for one line because, you know, that takes forever. Yeah, yeah, I know it's it's um it's so different than like, you know, if if you're going to use a clip from a film in your movie, let's say you you either licensed it or you fair used it. You have a nice copy of it and you have your editing timeline and you just zip around, you find the part that you want and you plop it in there. With a game, not quite that simple. <laughs> yeah, you have to it takes a little bit more thought to uh get get that moment that you need out of it. That's right, and as a YouTuber, I'm only using a few seconds of film at a time anyway. I've uh, got to be very careful about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you have my sympathies. Okay, well, I believe we've covered everything that I wanted to get to, and I thought that this was a very enlightening conversation. I learned a lot. I appreciate you for taking the time to speak with me. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we, I was um, I saw you made the post about the um, doing the video review. And I thought, you know, as, as we're recording this now, right, it's still before the wide release of the film. And so there's only so many people who've seen it. And so um, I was like, yeah, you're here in town. Yeah, let's uh, let's collaborate. So yeah, it was truly a golden opportunity for me. Yeah. And I really appreciate um, you for coming out to it. I mean, like, really, like, when you work on something for so long and if for so long it's just something that's like you're you're watching over like i've i've now seen the film probably the final film probably 15 times just because you have to when you make a movie yep just like the final check of a video before it goes live yeah exactly right and so i it's it's really really nice to um have such a welcoming crowd of people who are engaged and and wanted to come out and support it so uh thank you it was a pleasure to meet you, Aaron. I'm happy I was able to go in person and shake your hand. Yeah, me too. I was, um, as people were walking in, I was like, okay, I've seen the sprite. So I know what the sprite of him looks like. So, okay, who's got the goatee? Uh, yeah, so no, it was good. That's funny. I actually got my hair cut right beforehand. I was looking a little like Bob Ross, oh. so I had to trim it down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, did you get that Mother Direct shirt from the, uh, from Mother Forever? Or was that something you made, or...? I actually did get it from Mother Forever. They uh, collaborated with, have you heard of Job Job? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, they uh, they actually have those shirts for sale on their website. There are stickers as well. I didn't get the stickers, but I just had to snatch that t-shirt after the direct. Mostly everyone featured on there are original game characters from Mother Likes. 
But yeah, I just wanted to show my support for Mother Direct and Mother Forever. I love what they're doing and it's great to see the torch being passed along. I know Starman is still around, it's this pillar of the community, and I'm happy it exists because we can always go back to and again dig through the archives. I still actually go on there fairly often for research, and Starman is where I first heard about folks like Kenisu, who I collaborated with recently. He helped me with and provided original drawings for my history of the Mother Novels video, the novels written by Saori Kumi. I wouldn't have known about his attempts to translate it before Niasu Nekoban without browsing old Starman threads. It's inspiring to me that there's still new people all the time coming into the series, and I love welcoming new fans in. You know, it's interesting uh, when you talk about passing the torch, like that was definitely a hope that we had with this project was um, as an opportunity to allow the newer generation of fans to be able to get to know the older generation. But then also through uh, like working with Mother Forever and what have you to also kind of have that passing of the torch moment, because I really do. I really do feel like the current generation of fans through their research, through their um, game design and everything are really just like taking things to the next level. And so it's it's very exciting. You know, I, I feel the same way about film where it's just wonderful when 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 younger people can uh, discover an old movie and, and, and recognize its brilliance. You know what I mean? It's kind of like a it's not quite an intergenerational dialogue, but it you know, kind of is. Aaron, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for hearing me out. Thanks for talking with me and. I have a lot to work with for this little interview here. You're a wonderful person. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, no, you did great. Um, you know, it's, it's it's nice to have a casual conversation. Yeah, I, I, uh, I enjoy you ask good questions. All right. Well, we'll keep in touch and I'll follow your Instagram page there immediately after this. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Talk to you later, Thane. Have a good night. Sounds good, Aaron. You as well. Bye.